In this video, I'm going to take a look at lens flares, the different kinds of flares, and the lenses that I own that produce the most extravagant and fascinating flares. Flares cover a multitude of beautiful effects, or a multitude of sins, depending on your taste. Deliberately producing flares can be a lot of fun. In the right conditions, you can create amazing images with fascinating shapes and kaleidoscopic colours. They definitely add a new dimension to one's enjoyment of lenses. And you can see many examples of the artistic use of lens flare, not just in photographs, but also in films and TV programs. But then there are flares that really do need to be avoided, because they look bad, reduce contrasts, and mute the colours in an image. And talking about avoidance, I should say right up front that it's not good for your eyes to look directly at the sun when you're trying to compose a photo that captures flare, and I don't want to encourage this behaviour in any way. However, digital cameras or phones do give us an advantage here. You can compose photos looking at the screen, not directly at the sun. And you can also see how the lens is flaring on the screen, without damaging your eyes. I'm going to split the video up into three parts. In part one, I'll briefly explain how lenses produce flares, and why different lenses produce different kinds of flares. In part two, I'll show those different types of flares, with a lot of illustrative photos from my collection. And in part three, I'll talk about the lenses I own that seem to produce the most extravagant and most unusual looking effects. And a quick word on terminology. I'm going to be describing a lot of different types of flare, and there could be special technical terms for a particular flare effect I've missed. So please don't hesitate to point this out in the comments below. One other point to note, and that is I post-process the images you'll be seeing, sometimes quite aggressively. Here's a before and after example. Almost by definition, images with flares can lack contrast, and some of the more interesting effects can rather be obscured, so they really do need boosting. To understand how lenses produce flare, and why each make of lens has its own unique way of flaring, you need to look at the various components of a lens, as well as the way the camera itself captures light. Starting with the glass used in the lens, assuming it is glass. In fact, it's not just the glass but also the coatings and the optical design and the way the glass is curved, including the number of glass elements and how they're grouped. Light passing through the glass elements can be distorted and scattered before it hits the film or the sensor in the camera. So for example, curved glass distorts light away from the center of the lens, giving those cat-sized shapes to out-of-focus highlights when the lens is wide open. And it can twist the light, as you can see from this image, where I placed a star filter on the front of the lens, and the stars are twisted towards the edges. Flares and distorted highlights from the circular curved glass are often the most common types of flare you'll see wide open. Then you get the visual impact of a concentrated bright light source passing through each of the glass elements with the lens stopped down, resulting in geometric shapes and different objects appearing across the image, sometimes in a kaleidoscope of colours. In terms of multicoloured flares, this is normally the same effect you see when different colours of light are passing through glass and are separated into individual colours, something first documented by Sir Isaac Newton in 1666. And the light colours can also be refracted or change direction through the glass. Perhaps the most famously popular example is on this Pink Floyd album cover. The coatings applied to glass will also impact how a lens handles flares. Sometimes you can see the different colour coatings used on lenses, and while they're designed to reduce flare, they can also affect the colour of objects when lenses do flare. Perhaps the most extreme examples I've seen are from a Jupiter 9. The colours of the flares caused by the tint of the glass are very pronounced. Lenses made from radioactive glass, where the glass has turned a golden yellow, also have coloured flares, as we can see in this image, for instance. Light doesn't just pass through the glass, but it can also reflect or bounce off the glass elements, causing all kinds of issues, including ghosting and light leaks. I'll show you examples of these effects later. And by the way, sensors can capture light reflecting off the rear elements as well as the front elements. This kind of reflective flare reduces contrasts and colour saturation, and it's one of the main reasons why manufacturers work so hard on coatings, both for the front and rear elements. As well as the glass, there's the physical design of the lens body, with features like the size and the length of the body, the number of aperture blades, and how it's structured internally. Clearly, the position of the front element at the front of a lens can make a big difference to flare, especially if you're not using a lens hood. A lens like the Helios 44-2 has quite a recessed front element, and the body is acting like a lens hood. While other lenses have very exposed front elements, including ultra-wide fish eyes, like this 7 Artisans 4mm lens. And for these lenses, good coatings really help. 
The shape and size of the inside of the lens is a factor too. As I'll demonstrate later, light can bounce off the inside of the body at angles and through the glass before it's captured by the sensor. The design and number of aperture blades have another obvious impact on flares and the shape of flares. You can see their impact in the geometric shapes such as octagons or hexagons. Stop down, you can also see the impact of blades in the rendering of starbursts or sunstars, as well as the number of rays in those starbursts. If you have a lens with an even number of blades, say six blades, then the lens will produce six rays to the starburst. While if you have an odd number of blades, say nine, then it will produce double the amount of rays. For lenses made with curved edges to blades rather than straight edges, then you'll get rounder shapes to bouquet bubbles stop down, and possibly some other advantages in terms of reducing flares and ghosting. On the other hand, you might not see such clear geometric shapes or well-defined rays in starbursts. It all goes to show how lens design is often about compromises and accepting you can't please everyone all the time. Then there's the camera itself. The settings used for each photograph obviously don't just include the aperture stop, but also the ISO settings, how long the sensor is exposed to light, and so on. Photographers have a lot of options for controlling these variables, and different settings will result in different degrees of flare. Once light hits the sensor, the sensor will process that light in different ways, depending on the camera you're using, including conventional cameras and phone cameras. I'm not going to go into any detail about sensor technology and computational software, except to say a lot can go on behind the scenes to process the image you see from the camera, with various tweaks. However, one of the great things about extravagant lens flare is that it tends to overpower everything on an image, regardless of the settings or sensor, and then it becomes an essential part of the image, whether you like it or not. If you consider all the different types of lens flare, you can broadly divide them into two types. Flares that produce light leaks and glare, and flares that produce distinctive lines, shapes, and alien-looking objects. The first types of flare I'll cover are light leaks and glare. Light leaks are lighter patches appearing on the image. You can see them here. Often some bright light is hitting the lens from an angle, while glare is something that is caused more by head-on bright light. It's important to consider the angle that light hits and enters a lens during any discussion of flare, because this has a big impact on the type of flares you see, including light leaks and glare. Critically, bright light sources don't actually need to be in a lens's field of vision to cause flare. They can be off to the side of the lens. If a bright light source is pointed straight down the lens, and the light hits the sensor straight on, that's obviously one way to create flare, and dramatic blowouts and glare. Secondly, the bright light source might still be visible in the lens's field of vision, but towards the edge of the frame or the top or bottom of the frame, and this can produce different kinds of effects. And thirdly, the brightest light source might be outside of the lens's field of vision altogether, but that light source can still create flares, especially if the light plays on the surface of the glass elements in the front of the lens, and this is picked up by the sensor. And even if the brightest light source is completely out of view, light can still reflect off objects that are in view. All sorts of effects can be produced, including a range of interesting out-of-focus effects and flares. I can show you an example of the impact of different angles of light using a lens that creates a lot of fascinating flare, the Mamiya Secor 55 f1.4. I'll move a torch across the front of the lens, starting out of sight on the left-hand side of the lens and moving all the way around to the right-hand side, while always pointing the torchlight in the direction of the lens. This was rather quick, so I'll slow down the video and stop it at relevant points. What you can see here, I hope, is that even when the torch is way out of the lens's field of vision, it's producing light leaks on the image. This lens is so prone to creating geometric shapes that one soon becomes apparent, but for the moment it's light leaks. Then there's a phantom image of the front of the torch accompanied by a hexagon shape. The front of the torch itself hasn't actually come into the lens's field of vision yet, but the lens and the glass elements are channeling the bright light to the sensor. And finally, the torch itself comes into view and starts to shine straight down the lens and hits the sensor straight on, with obvious glare and more coloured shapes and quite alien objects appear. For light leaks, then, lighter patches don't have any obvious shapes in them, so as I demonstrated, they're quite subtle and they don't look like flares at all, really. But this can be bad flare. It's bad because it gives photos a less vibrant look by reducing light and dark contrasts in patches of the image and also reducing the vibrancy of colours. 
It's the kind of flair that lens designers have tried hard to reduce for decades now by coating the glass in their lenses. It's amusing sometimes to read about lenses that have super coatings designed to eliminate flare, because what manufacturers are really trying to do, above all else, is to try to minimize light leaks and the loss of contrast and color vibrancy. I've called this bad flare, but for some photographers, and I'd include myself here, some of us rather like images with light leaks from uncoated lenses. Light leaks, of course, can be reduced by having a good hood on the lens, but sometimes I'll take the hood off to actually encourage some light leakage. The reason for doing this is that images that are washed out by light leaks can have a beautiful painterly look, a sort of watercolory painterly look. And after a little bit of processing to add some color contrast, the images can look rather lovely and artistic, especially if you're into photos with a lot of smooth bouquet. Next is ghosting, an effect caused by brighter light or objects that multi-coatings have also been designed to minimize. I have mixed feelings about ghosting. It's quite noticeable with closer up product shots, such as this lens photographed wide open. There's ghosting around the white letters, so the letters seem less sharp and vivid, and this is not good. Stop down, of course, the ghosting would go. You can also see ghosting, sometimes called a halo effect, around the edge of this flower. More interesting to me are these images, where the lenses produce more obvious ghosts of very bright lights. This one was taken at Lord's Cricket Ground. It's quite a striking result. I should also mention coma because that's another result of flare. You can see it around small bright lights, such as stars photographed at night. They make stars look like comets. There's also coma in this photo, zooming into the details. I've got some intriguing larger examples of bat-like shapes to show you later. When an intense bright light source enters directly in front of and down a lens, the flare can look very dramatic on an image. Extreme light can completely blow out parts of an image, or at least produce large patches of glare. It's fun to sometimes deliberately try to blow out images for creative effect, as I've done here. But the impact of blowouts is something lens manufacturers also work hard to reduce through improved lens coatings. I'm always amazed at how I can point some of my more modern lenses straight at the bright sun, and the lens and the camera sensor produces a clean image without loads of flare shapes and blowouts. You don't just see blowouts with direct sunlight. As a photographer, it's so irritating when the lens can't handle fluffy white clouds on a sunny day without blowing out the whites in some of those clouds, even when you think you've got all of the exposure settings right. Equally irritating is when glare becomes more intrusive on an image. Compared to light leaks, where to a certain extent you can deal with the loss of contrast in post-processing, large patches of glare are far more difficult to handle. Definitely areas where better coatings help. And while we're on the subject of nuisance flares and glares, you can also get reflections from inside the lens, such as you can see on this image. This is a reflection of the inside sides of a Carl Zeiss Jena Sonne lens. And an even more striking example of reflected light from another Carl Zeiss Jena lens, this time with the aperture blades being lit up by reflected light. All these are problem areas where better designs and better coatings definitely help. The next type of flare involves sunbursts during the day and starbursts at night. I'll just call them starbursts from now on. Starbursts are a common type of flare that are produced by both new and old lenses, including lenses with the very best anti-flare resistant coatings. Clearly you don't tend to see this effect with the naked eye. It's something produced by the configuration of glass and aperture blades in the lens. Starbursts are something that photographers often cherish. They can add a striking dimension to some compositions. Not all lenses are good at producing good, clean starbursts. Some lenses produce rather mushy effects and poorly defined rays, even fully stopped down. So if you find a lens that's good at starbursts, it can be great fun to use. If you search online for lens starbursts or sun stars, you'll find people's recommendations for the best lenses, and many beautiful images too. There's another kind of straight line effect produced by flare that I'd describe as a light fall effect. This is where you see streaks of light spread diagonally across an image, emanating from where the source of bright light is. Similar to producing swirly, twisty bouquet effects, it helps to have the right lens. And the Auto Tacoma 35mm f2.3 is one of my best light fall lenses. 
Not only do you have to have the right lens and conditions to create light force, you also need to find the right angle of attack for the light to enter the lens to create the most striking flare. It may help to have the bright light source slightly out of the frame, but there's no set formula for success. Sometimes moving the lens just a few millimeters around can make a big difference. When the light falls are accompanied by other flare shapes, the images can end up looking rather spiritual. There's one other type of horizontal or diagonal light fall that looks rather like an arrow or a dart shooting out across the frame. I got some examples to show you. They tend to appear when the lens is pointed straight at the sun or an extremely bright light source. And to end this section, a clip from a Minolta 55 f1.7, where a dart moves magically across the frame as I change the focus distance. This brings us on to the creation of flares with different types of lines and shapes. I'll look at the most common shapes, and then show you a few more unique, intriguing effects. The most common shapes we see in flares from shots taken wide open are circles and bubbles. I've got loads of examples of these effects. Perhaps the best of all is this one. I like the symmetry of the circles from the center. This image also illustrates another interesting feature of circular flare, the coloration inside the circles, and not just one color. Here you can see a kaleidoscope of colors in the inner circle. The circles don't have to be at the center of the photo, of course. They can appear anywhere in the frame, and more than once, sometimes arranged in a diagonal line across the frame. With the bright light and at appropriate angle, especially if it's nearly, but not quite, shining directly down the lens, you'll only see part of the circular flare showing. Some lenses produce extremely vivid colors along the edges of this kind of circular flare. As well as flares, with the right out of focus highlights, lenses also produce bouquet bubbles of all kinds of shapes and sizes. I won't go into any details about these bubbles, as they're not really flares, they're more out of focus highlights, except to say that one of the more interesting flare effects to me is where the bouquet bubbles are filled with a rainbow of colors, and this is a result of lens flare. I'm always happy to see these little multicolored bubbles, sometimes lurking in the background. The next type of flare I'm going to categorize as a 3D funnel effect, and rather than try to describe this shape, I'm going to show you some examples, starting with this shot. Now have a closer look at the circle at the front. It has a sort of star in the center. These stars can become much more clearly defined and elaborate, as I'll show you in a moment. To show you the effects in action, this video is from the Tomioka Auto Revunon 55 f1.2. And here are four photos taken at slightly different apertures with an Auto Yashinon 50 f2. I had a lot of fun playing with these effects, trying to get the sun at exactly the right angle across the front of the lens to maximize the impact. The star shape in the center of each circle is very clear in these images, while the 3D funnel actually looks more like a fan. And these beautiful and intriguing flares in the kitchen from a Mamiya Seacore 55 f1.8. Staying with stars within bubbles, I was amazed to see an incredibly intricate design appearing within bouquet balls from this lens. You can only see the effects if you zoom right in. I'm not sure I own another lens that produces these kinds of effects in such detail. And zooming into another shot from the same lens. The most common type of artifact after round circles are geometric shapes produced by the straight edge aperture blades of lenses. Obviously the lens needs to be stopped down to produce these shapes, and normally to maximize the impact of these effects, I stop the lens all the way down. In more extreme cases, you can see a whole collection of geometric shapes across the frame, 
including shapes within shapes. This photo is one of my best examples, and I've deliberately processed it into black and white, so it accentuates the shapes and not the colours. The colours inside the geometric shapes don't have to be white, as we've already seen. Different lenses fill the shapes with different colours. One of the fun things about trying out different lenses for flare is when a particular lens produces a strange looking flare, a flare that seems to bear no relation to the more standard types of circular or geometric shapes we normally see. For instance, take this shot from a Helios 44. It's like there's something buzzing around the image. It helps I've isolated the effect against a darker background. I don't see these rogue looking flares very often, but when I do it's almost a magic moment. And then there are lenses when you can reverse elements to produce other kinds of fascinating flare. Here are some photos from a Helios 44 Zebra lens, where I've reversed the front element. And if you zoom into the flares and artifacts, you get some really fascinating results, such as these effects. Including some more tiny 3D funnels. Or on this image, these flying bat-like flare effects. Finally, I'd like to show you one of my all-time favorite flare effects, a globe produced by a Mamiya Seacore 55 f1.4. As you can see, there are all kinds of flare shapes on the image, but it's the beautifully rendered globe that really appeals to me. It's fun trying to catch these types of effects in photos at night with a bright torch on the floor or a table. Indeed, that's really one of the key messages from all these images. It's a lot of fun playing with lens flares. Talking about having fun and globes as well, how about this flare effect from a circular fisheye lens, where the flare is partially outside the frame of the image? And this one, where the lens has such a wide angle of view that it produces probably the ultimate example of flare captured inside the body of the lens showing up in the photograph. Now we've seen examples of different types of flare, what conclusions can we make about lenses that have the most flare for flare? In a way, you can make your own mind up about the lenses you like the look of the most from the photos I've shown you. But I'm going to conclude the video with my top three ranking of brands and groups covering the lenses I've included in the video. And number three, I'm going to group two Russian 85mm lenses together, the Jupiter 9 and the Helios 40. The Jupiter will produce flare shapes in the right conditions. But what I admire about the lens is its total commitment to producing large, part circles with colourful edges. They're hardly ever full circles, and it never fails to produce these effects if you get the angle right. Inside the circle is filled with a purple haze. It's so predictable, it actually helps you compose more artistic shots. Moving on to the Helios 40, it's more eccentric and unpredictable, but it does produce more distinctive shapes when the mood takes it. In contrast to the Jupiter's deep purple, the Helios produces large shapes filled with a lovely blue colour. The other effect my Helios produces is a very striking shaft of very bright light that seems to appear out of nowhere and completely blows most of the image. I've got a good example of this effect here. It happens when you get precisely the right angle of attack to the sun. I like this flare, and I've used it to produce more atmospheric and dramatic images than would otherwise be possible looking at the actual scene. And number two, I'm going to go for Takuma lenses. There are a number of Takuma lenses that flare extravagantly all the way from the fisheye Takuma, that is a veritable flaring monster. Then there are the many different Fast 50s, 55s and 58s that can produce some amazingly beautiful results. And not to forget the extraordinary Takuma 35 f2.3 that produces streaks of light, and in this image, a lot more as well. 
And number one, the top flaring lenses. It has to be the lenses I own made by Tomioka. For some reason, my Tomioka made lenses flare majestically and in rather sophisticated ways. They love being pointed at or across the sun or at a very bright light. Although if you don't care for flare, it's not such good news. Starting with the Tomioka Auto Revunon 55 f1.2, this lens with its large front and rear elements sucks in light and produces very distinctive flare, as I've already demonstrated. And then there's Tomioka's 55 f1.4, produced under different brand names. My version is the Mamiya Seiko. What a fun lens this is to use in extreme light conditions. You know, I think it's even better than the f1.2, purely for playing with flare effects. And it's particularly fun to try and track down the elusive and magical green globe the lens can produce sometimes. I hope you can just about see a glimpse of it moving across the far left of this clip. Then I own three other lenses supposed to be made by Tomioka, and they're all quite extravagant flarers. They're also fine lenses in normal conditions, I hasten to add. I'll end with a very brief recap of some of their flares. And as a postscript, a quick shout out to Minolta Rocco Fast 50s. I've read that some of these lenses can be prone to flare, so I very recently purchased a 55 f1.7, and it does indeed produce quite extravagant flare when pushed to extremes. A lens serious to enjoy playing with in the future, and proof there's potentially no end to my personal addiction to trying lenses that flare. Well, that's my take on lens flare, featuring some of the lenses I own that produce the most dramatic flare effects. I can't possibly claim to have covered even a small fraction of lenses that are prone to outrageous flares. And this is where it would be great if you could add your own experiences of lenses that flare in fascinating ways. So please add your suggestions below. I'm looking forward to reading them. And if I've missed any interesting types of flare effects, please describe those too. I'd be very grateful if you could subscribe if you haven't already done so. And until the next time, all the best.